Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're going to continue on with our discussion of the pharmacology of different antimicrobial agents, specifically um, antibiotics. Um, we talked about penicillins and then cephalosporins, and in this lecture we're going to talk about the carbapenems, which there's just a few of, um, as trianem and then some beta-lactamase inhibitors, which are drugs that we combine with other agents like penicillins or cephalosporins. And then we'll also talk about vancomycin. The carbapenems include antibiotics like imipenem, meropenem, and doripenem. There is another carbapenem called ertapenem, E-R-T-A-P-E-N-E-M, ertapenem, but I haven't listed ertapenem because it lacks coverage against some important bacteria, so it doesn't have the same coverage that these three agents have. For example, ertapenem is not active against Pseudomonas, um, it's not active against Enterococcus, um, and those are some important bacteria. I haven't, so I haven't listed that one like I've listed the others. So, carbapenems. Carbapenems are beta-lactams, just like the cephalosporins, just like the penicillins. So they have that beta-lactam ring like the other agents do. The mechanism of action of these carbapenems is to interfere with synthesis of the bacterial cell wall. Something important about the carbapenems is they really, they're relatively new antibiotics. Um, <clears throat> there's not as much resistance to them. So they do resist most beta-lactamases. Um, because of this, because they um, have very broad coverage, which if you look over here at their coverage, I mean, they cover almost everything. They cover a lot. There's some of the STDs that they don't cover, um, spirochetes, chlamydia, but besides that, they have very, very broad coverage. So because they have very broad coverage um, and because they resist most beta-lactamases, we, we don't have a lot of resistance to them. They're very good or used um, frequently in empiric therapy for serious infections. Their spectrum of activity, again, is very broad. They have good gram-positive coverage. If you look here at the gram-positive coverage, we've got gram-positive cocci and bacilli up here in blue, including um, most staph, enterococcus, strep, listeria. One thing to keep in mind, though, is that for the gram-positive coverage, it's MSSA only. Okay, so that's been the common thread with a lot of the antibiotics that we've talked about thus far, um, the penicillins, most of the cephalosporins, um, we did talk about one cephalosporin that has um, coverage for MRSA, um, but for the most part, the cephalosporins don't have MRSA coverage. Um, same thing for the carbapenems. The carbapenems are only going to cover MSSA, which is methicillin sensitive staph aureus. If it's MRSA, which is methicillin resistant, staph aureus, um, the carbapenems are not going to cover it. Carbapenems also have really good gram-negative coverage. Um, if you look at the gram-negative coverage here, we've got Neisseria gonorrhea, um, Neisseria meningitis. Um, we also have coverage for things like E. coli, um, H. influenza, Klebsiellus, Protobelis, uh, Pseudomonas coverage, Salmonella coverage, um, <clears throat> the coverage for Neisseria gonorrhea um, <clears throat> includes coverage for most penicillinase producing strains. So it, the carbapenems work against most gonorrhea, including resistant strands or sorry, strains, resistant strains. There's also anaerobic coverage, a lot of anaerobic coverage, as you see here. Um, Doripenem retains activity against resistant strands of pseudomonas. 
And this is really important because in the other lectures, um, the first two lectures, we were talking about different antibiotics that have coverage against Pseudomonas. But really for almost every agent I think that I brought up, I had a little asterisk and I said, you know, be careful because there's an increase in resistance. Be careful, there's an increase in resistance, right? We had that warning over and over. We have a lot of resistant um, strains of Pseudomonas appearing. So the fact that Doripenem re uh, retains activity against the Pseudomonas is important. That might be something that we use in a situation where we have a resistant strain of Pseudomonas. The carbapenems are all available um, intravenously, so they're not available by mouth. This is another reason why they're typically only given for serious infections. Um, we're not going to deliver something intravenously for a mild or moderate infection. Um, this is just for really serious infections. The carbapenems penetrate tissues and fluids. They have really good penetra penetration, including the CSF. So these can be used for meningitis, for example. Um, they penetrate the CS into the CSF when inflammation is present. We said that inflammation increases the permeability of the blood-brain barrier. When inflammation is present, the vessels dilate and there's increased permeability between the endothelial cells. Um, and the purpose of this is to make it easier for white blood cells to come to the area. Um, but this also happens to increase permeability into the central nervous system, which helps some antibiotics penetrate the central nervous system. Um, so when inflammation is present, so for example, when um, a patient has meningitis, then all of the carbapenems will penetrate into the central nervous system. So they'll get into the cerebrospinal fluid. Um, meropenem, meropenem, can penetrate even with no inflammation. So meropenem um, penetrates the CSF even better. There doesn't have to be any inflammation. There's just no concern there. It penetrates into the central nervous system um, very easily. Imipenem can be combined with celastin. Um, what celastin does is celastin inhibits an enzyme called renal um, dehydropeptidase. So it inhibits renal dehydropeptidase. Um, and what that does is it allows for prolonged activity of the imipenem. Typically what happens is the imipenem gets broken down in the kidney, um, specifically I believe in the PCT but the imipenem gets broken down in the kidney. When we combine imipenem with celastin, it stops the breakdown of the imipenem. So it prolongs the activity of the imipenem. Um, notice that that's the only one we combine with celastin. The other agents, the meropenem and doripenem, do not get combined with um, celastin. That's only something we do with imipenem. Um, note that we need to adjust the doses of all of these agents in renal insufficiency. These are all cleared renally, so if your patient has some sort of um, renal failure, then we need to adjust doses. When we look at the adverse drug effects, um, again, allergic reaction is something that we see commonly um, with antibiotics. So allergic reaction is something that's possible, and as always, there's a wide range in the severity of the allergic reaction. It could be a little bit of itchiness, maybe some mild hives or a rash, all the way to, you know, really severe hives and swelling, all the way to an anaphylactic reaction where the patient's airways close and they can't breathe. So allergic reactions are, you know, there's a very wide range of what an allergic reaction is, but allergic reactions are possible with carbapenems. There is a 1% cross-reactivity between the carbapenems and penicillins. So what that means is um, if you had 100 people who were allergic to penicillin and you gave them a carbapenem, one of those people would have a reaction. 
So one out of 100 people who are allergic to penicillin are also allergic to carbapenems. There's a 1% cross-reactivity. That's a lot lower than the cephalosporins. Cephalosporins were like 3 to 5% cross-reactivity. So patients are a lot less likely to have a reaction to the carbapenems, um, <clears throat> but it's still possible. One in 100 is a decent number, um, so it's still possible. So the way we treat that is just use caution if it's a true allergy. Uh, always ask the patient, you know, what happened to determine if it was a true allergy to make sure it wasn't just like an adverse drug effect like upset stomach or diarrhea. Those are not allergies. Also, um, figure out the severity of the allergy. If it was a really mild allergy, um, chances are the patient's going to be able to take the carbapenem with no issues and that it'll be just fine. However, if the patient had an anaphylactic reaction to the penicillin, well, then that's something that you should be much more worried about. And you should try and use another agent um, if possible, which there's almost always something else that you could use. Um, if there was absolutely nothing else that you could use, then obviously the, the benefit would outweigh the risk. And in that case, you're just going to make sure you have an EpiPen ready. Um, you're going to be in the hospital already. So make sure you have an EpiPen ready. Make sure you have everything there ready to go just in case the patient has a reaction. Um, but again, almost always there's going to be some other option that you can use. Um, <clears throat> when imipenem and celastin are used together, there's an increased incidence of other adverse drug effects like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and possibly seizures. That's due to the um, higher levels of imipenem that, are, um, that are, are present. Again, when you combine the agents, you're gonna decrease the, the excretion um, and you decrease the breakdown of imipenem, so imipenem can build up. If imipenem builds up too high, then you can start to see these other adverse drug effects occur. Um, as always with any of the other antibiotics as well, we always see the possibility of opportunistic infections, but these are really common with broad spectrum antibiotics like carbapenems. Because they kill such a wide spectrum of bacteria, they're really gonna take out our natural flora. Um, we naturally have bacteria present in the vagina, um, on our skin, in our mouth, in our GI tract. Like that bacteria is supposed to be there. And there's a, a, a very delicate balance that exists between the fungi and the bacterium that are living in our body, um, that colonize our body. Anything that upsets that balance can open us up to the opportunity of an opportunistic infection. So um, when we take, again, especially broad spectrum antibiotics like this, it opens up the possibility of infectious diarrhea. Um, <clears throat> or candidiasis. So yeast infections, like vaginal yeast infections or oral pharyngeal thrush. Um, and then again, diarrhea which can be mild antibiotic-associated diarrhea, or which can be more severe, like C. diff. Astreonam is a drug called a monobactam. So um, we're moving on from carbapenems, and now we're talking about monobactams. Specifically, the drug that we're talking about is called astreonam. Um, <clears throat> Astreonam is a beta-lactam, so it's classified similarly to all of the other drugs that we've talked about so far. It is a beta-lactam. When you look at the structure of Astreonam, though, um, it only has one ring in its structure. That's the beta-lactam ring. That's the only ring that it has. That's why it's called a monobactam, right? Mono meaning one, so it's like one beta Actam. It has one beta lactam ring. If you look down here at the bottom, this is showing you a strianam. You can see the beta lactam ring, and that's the only ring that's present. If you look, for example, at imipenem, which is another type of beta lactam antibiotic, right? It's a carbapenem. It has the beta lactam ring, and then you see another ring right next to it. Um, <clears throat> all of those other agents are going to have multiple. Um, 
rings present, whereas the monobacterium has one ring. Um, H. trianum works like the other beta-lactam agents. It disrupts bacterial cell wall synthesis, and the um, bacterium can't live without an intact bacterial cell wall. The spectrum of activity of H. trianum is limited to gram-negative bacteria only. Now this does include Pseudomonas, so it has Pseudomonas coverage, but it only has gram-negative coverage. Um, there is no gram-positive coverage. So it does not treat strep, it does not um, treat staph, um, no gram-positive coverage. Also, no um, anaerobe coverage. Okay, so only gram-negative bacteria. Um, it's effective against gram-negative bacteria, though. When we talk about Aestrianam, something that makes Aestrianam um, important or kind of special out of the other beta-lactams is that it has very low immunogenic potential. Um, what that means is that it doesn't stimulate the immune system very much. Um, we talked about antibiotics, and we said a lot of antibiotics have the potential to stimulate an allergic reaction, um, especially all of these beta-lactams. They stimulate allergic reactions. Um, but Aestrianam does not stimulate allergic reactions very much. Um, it has very, very low potential to cause an allergic reaction. It has um, barely any cross-reactivity with the other beta-lactams. So Aestrianam is considered a safe alternative in patients who are allergic to penicillins, cephalosporins, or carbapenems. So if you have an agent, if you're trying to treat a gram-negative bacteria, that's um, or like Pseudomonas, for example, and um, you had a patient who had an anaphylactic reaction to penicillin or cephalosporin or imipenem or whatever, um, and you don't want to give any of those agents because the reaction was anaphylactic, um, you can give Aestrianam. Aestrianam is considered a safe alternative because it does not have that cross-reactivity. When we look at the kinetics, it's not given by mouth, um, so it's kind of a pain, um, not used outpatient very much, but it's given either IV or IM. Also, the drug can accumulate in patients with renal failure. It is cleared via the kidneys. So if there's um, kidney dysfunction present, then the drug can accumulate. So we decrease the dose in patients who have renal failure. Um, <clears throat> as far as adverse drug effects go, um, there's very little toxicity with Aestrianam. It's a relatively well-tolerated drug. There can be some phlebitis that occurs. Um, so like inflammation um, of the vessels, like right where it's being injected. So there can be some irritation at the, uh, and inflammation of the vessels at the injection site. Um, <clears throat> some rash can occur. Uh, very rarely there can be abnormal LFTs. So the liver function tests can um, appear abnormally, but that's very rare. Um, again, it's, it's relatively well tolerated. Beta-lactamase inhibitors. Um, I kind of mentioned beta-lactamase inhibitors like clavulonic acid in the initial presentation on the penicillins, but we'll talk about them in depth now. Beta-lactamase inhibitors include things like clavulonic acid, um, which is really common. Tazobactam and sulbactam are common. Um, the other two aren't as common, vibrobactam and abibactam. Um, but these agents are all beta-lactamase inhibitors, and they inhibit beta-lactamase. They don't have very good, um, or some of them much of any, antimicrobial action themselves. That's not why we're using them. So we don't use these alone. Um, the beta-lactamase inhibitors are never dosed alone. They're dosed in combination with an antibiotic. Um, <clears throat> the reason that we would combine a beta-lactamase inhibitor with an antibiotic is to allow the antibiotic to work better, to allow the antibiotic to stay around um, and not be destroyed so that it can kill the bacteria. So what happens is when a bacteria becomes resistant to one of the beta-lactam antibiotics, 
So um, like penicillin or cephalosporin, um, when the bacteria becomes resistant to that antibiotic, it produces a beta something, some sort of like beta lactamase, right? Beta lactamase, like penicillinase. Those are enzymes that destroy the beta lactam ring. Okay, so cleavage of that beta lactam ring destroys the antimicrobial activity of the beta lactam antibiotic. So the antibiotic produces this enzyme. The enzyme breaks down the antibiotic so it can't work anymore. Um, <clears throat> and then it, the antibiotic is useless, right? The bacteria is now resistant to that antibiotic. Um, <clears throat> and that's what you can see over here in the, in the graph, right? This is the number of viable bacteria here on the vertical axis and then time. So if you look right in black is no drug. So no drug, the, the number of bacteria increases, increases, increases. With um, just the beta lactamase inhibitor, increases, increases, increases. With amoxicillin only, which is a beta lactam antibiotic, um, amoxicillin is a, it's classified as a penicillin um, antibiotic. Um, with amoxicillin only, you see that the amoxicillin does kill some of the bacteria, but obviously the bacteria are able to, um, to grow anyways, right? They're resistant to that amoxicillin because they're still growing like crazy. Um, so that means the bacteria must be producing some sort of beta lactamase, like penicillinase. So, but then if you look at this purple line, look, the purple line here, when we combine amoxicillin with clavulonic acid, now the number of bacteria decreases rapidly until it's completely gone. So adding the clavulonic acid allowed the amoxicillin to work. It allowed the amoxicillin to destroy the bacteria without being eaten up by that enzyme. So the way that beta-lactamase inhibitors work, again, is they are a substrate for beta-lactamase. So they bind, the drug binds to the beta-lactamase and it inhibits that enzyme. That way the enzyme does not break down the beta-lactam antibiotic. And that allows the beta-lactam antibiotic to do its job. So because these beta-lactamase inhibitors aren't the ones that are actually killing the bacteria, we don't give them alone, we formulate them in combination with a beta-lactam antibiotic. Um, common combinations include um, amoxicillin and clavulonic acid. Um, amoxicillin and clavulonic acid is uh, the generic name for augmentin. Uh, I'm sure you guys have heard of Augmentin before if you work in any doctor's office or hospital or pharmacy. It's a very, very commonly prescribed drug. Um, <clears throat> but that adding the clavulonic acid increases the spectrum of that amoxicillin so that it can cover some resistant bugs. Um, Augmentin is given frequently for sinusitis. Um, we see it for resistant otitis media. The thing with otitis media, um, otitis media or a, a um, middle ear infection, we don't have to treat that with antibiotics. A otitis media is almost always self-limiting. So um, we see it mostly in children, but the kids will come in, they'll have an earache, you'll see, you know, inflammation, um, diagnose them with otitis media. Typically, um, it will progress for a few days and then it'll start getting better on its own. And typically they don't need antibiotics, but that is pretty hard to tell a mom. The mom's there, they've got their little kid, the little one's not feeling good, they're cranky, their ears hurting them. Um, so it's, you know, and they took the time to take them into you, it's hard to, for the mom to, to pick or dad to walk away without an antibiotic. Um, <clears throat> but we'll, we'll talk about that in pediatrics. But if you decide to treat otitis media, the drug of choice is um, plain amoxicillin. So we typically give just plain amoxicillin for otitis media if we decide to give an antibiotic. The augmentin, right, the combination of amoxicillin plus clavulonic acid, 
is given for resistant otitis media. So for example, like the kid might have had an antibiotic um, recently in the past. If the kids had an antibiotic recently and they still developed a secret infection, it's more likely that that would be resistant otitis media. Again, we'll talk about that more when we talk about pediatric pharmacology. Um, also, augmentin is given for bites. Uh -huh, like bites when the skin is broken, either human bites or animal bites. We see it used for both of those. Um, <clears throat> strep, people frequently ask about strep um, when talking about augmentin, but the drug of choice, the initial drug of choice for strep throat, right, group A um, strep pharyngitis is penicillin. Okay, so um, penicillin is what we normally see used for strep. Another combination um, of a beta-lactam with a beta-lactamase inhibitor is piperacillin and tazobactam, um, or for short, we frequently call that piptazo. Um, piptazo is a, a very strong antibiotic that's typically used for more severe infections, um, not necessarily, pre or not prescribed frequently um, for like outpatient. Um, <clears throat> other beta-lactams can also be combined with beta-lactamase inhibitors, so including um, some of the cephalosporins as well as a carbapenem. So when we look at the cephalosporins that are combined with beta-lactamase inhibitors, we see um, a couple different third generation agents. So ceftolazine and tazobactam, and then ceftazidime and avibactam. So those are both third generation cephalosporins combined with a beta-lactamase inhibitor. Um, these again, they're not commonly used. These are very, very strong um, combinations of antibiotics. And um, we only use these when we have a infection with a multi-drug resistant pathogen. Okay, so um, use when there's a multi-drug resistant or MDR pathogen. So that means a pathogen that's resistant to multiple different drugs. Um, <clears throat> so these are, these are the big guns. We only use them when absolutely necessary. Um, ceph ceftolazine tazo um, is used for resistant enterobacter species and multi-drug resistant pseudomonas. Uh, again, with pseudomonas, we do see a lot of resistance starting to develop. So um, if you find pseudomonas that's multi-drug resistant, then this combination would be appropriate. Ceftazidime and abibactam, um, again, has the coverage of the above agent. So it's got enterobacter coverage. It's got coverage of um, multi-drug resistant pseudomonas. Um, and really just generally broad gram negative coverage. It doesn't have much gram positive coverage. It doesn't really cover anaerobes. So we really look at that for gram negative coverage. The use of these agents is um, typically for either intra abdominal infections, right? So an intra abdominal infection with some sort of MDR pathogen, in which case we combine it with another drug called metronidazole, which we'll talk about metronidazole in another lecture. Also, we see these used for complicated UTIs. Um, complicated UTIs, like for example, pyelonephritis. Okay, so we're not talking about just your average urinary tract infection, okay? um, much more severe than that with resistant organisms. Um, meropenem, which is a carbaba uh, carbaba <laughs> carbapenem, sorry. Um, meropenem, which is a carbapenem antibiotic, can also be combined with a beta-lactamase inhibitor. So we see meropenem and vavorbactam. Um, this is also used for complicated UTIs. So for like pyelonephritis, for example. Um, <clears throat> now we're going to change gears a little bit um, and talk about vancomycin. 
Vancomycin is also a drug that disrupts bacterial cell wall synthesis. Um, but vancomycin is kind of talked about on its own. Um, it's a really particular drug when we talk about um, when we talk about some of its kinetics specifically, but it's a good drug. It's a really strong drug and it is used for all sorts of different infections. So it's really important to talk a lot about vancomycin because of its use so much and because of all of its kind of peculiar kinetics. So vancomycin disrupts bacterial cell wall synthesis. Um, its spectrum of activity includes aerobic and anaerobic gram-positive bacteria. So it's got good gram-positive coverage, including MRSA. Remember, MRSA is methicillin-resistant staph aureus. We've only got um, talked about a couple drugs thus far that cover MRSA. So the number of drugs that cover MRSA are limited. Not all antibiotics do. Um, but vancomycin is one of those that does have good MRSA coverage. Uh, also covers... Um, MRSE, that's the first time we've seen MRSE. MRSE is methicillin resistant staphylococcus epidermis. So methicillin resistant staph epidermis. So it covers both types of resistant staph, resistant staph aureus and resistant staph epidermis. It also covers enterococcus species um, as well as C. diff, um, Clostridium difficile, which recently Clostridium difficile has been um, kind of recategorized as Clostridioides. Clostridioides. So Clostridioides difficile. Um, it's still C. diff, which that's what we call it, a C. diff. Um, but vancomycin is also effective against C. diff. Um, really quick, C. diff is typically a infection in the GI tract, which I think we'll talk about this in a second. But this is a opportunistic infection that's typically in the GI tract. So when we give the vancomycin to treat C. diff, we're going to give the vancomycin orally really the only time we're going to give vancomycin orally or by mouth because we actually want the drug to get into the GI tract because that's where the bacteria is. Um, it does not get absorbed out of the GI tract. So that's we wouldn't give it orally if we wanted to treat any other type of infection. Okay? But for C. diff, um, we would use PO vanco. Vancomycin, oh, here it is down here, sorry. Vancomycin, again, is used for various different types of infections. We see it used for skin and soft tissue infections. Um, <clears throat> we see it for infective endocarditis. We see it for nosocomial pneumonia. Um, so far, we've really only talked about community-acquired pneumonia, but pneumonia can also be nosocomial um, acquired, which is typically more serious and more likely to be associated with resistant strains. Um, in all of those cases, the vancomycin is given IV because, again, it's not absorbed from the GI tract. So if you need it to be systemically um, distributed, then it needs to be given intravenously. C. diff, however, is in the GI tract, so giving it by mouth is fine because you're going to be delivering the drug directly to the site of action in that case. Um, the kinetics of vancomycin, again, are, are important. There's some important points for us to point out when we talk about dosing and monitoring vancomycin. First, there's poor oral absorption. So we give vancomycin IV unless we're treating C. diff in the GI tract. Um, the frequency of vancomycin, so how frequently you're going to give the drug, um, is based on renal function. So we need, because it's cleared renally, so the better the renal function, the quicker it's going to be cleared from the body. Um, if the patient has really poor renal function, um, this can last for a really long time. And you can end up giving it, I mean, every 48 hours. You can really stretch out that interval in patients who have really poor renal function. 
So it's very important to make sure you're basing the frequency on their renal function. That means you've got to be monitoring serum creatinine. Um, you're going to be monitoring the serum creatinine in order to come up with that, um, that, that frequency that you're going to dose at. A loading dose can be given if you need to get to therapeutic concentrations quickly. Remember, it typically takes about four or five half-lifes before the drug gets to um, steady state concentration. But if you're treating a really serious infection, um, then you don't have that long, right? You can't wait that long before you get to you know, steady state concentration. So a loading dose can be given to get you there quickly. And this is really commonly done. Loading, dose are typically, loading doses are typically based on weight. So dosing of vancomycin um, isn't always one size fits all. Um, there are a lot of specific parameters that you would use when you're dosing vancomycin. I do encourage you guys to go on up to date and pull up vancomycin drug information and just kind of look through some of it. Look through the monitoring and dosing just to kind of see the information that they have available to you. Um, <clears throat> pharmacists will frequently be involved with this as well. Now we do monitor serum concentrations of vancomycin to make sure that we have optimal drug concentrations. We have to make sure that um, the lowest that the drug concentration gets is between 10 and 20 micrograms per milliliter. So that's what the trough should be. When we monitor drug concentrations, sometimes we measure a peak um, which is like the highest that it is. Sometimes we measure a trough. Um, it just depends on the drug and what our point is. If we're trying to monitor to make sure it's not toxic, we normally look at a, a peak. But in this case with the Vanco, we're trying to make sure the concentration is, is um, high enough to be killing that bacteria. So we're gonna look at the trough. The trough is like the lowest concentration, the lowest that that serum concentration gets. Because it's a trough, we obtain the blood, we draw the blood right before they dose. Okay, so you get a trough right before the dose is given because that's like the lowest that it's gonna be. And then as soon as you get the dose, you're putting more drug into the bloodstream. So obviously the, the concentration is gonna go up. Um, so the, the, um, a trough is typically gotten before the fourth or fifth dose because that's how long it takes to steady to get to steady state unless a loading dose is given which that's typically what would happen typically you would give a loading dose and you would calculate your frequency and your dose and then um, you would give your next dose and you can um you can monitor your trough before you go and give that that second normal dose and again, the goal is to be between 10 and 20 micrograms per milliliter. Um, adverse drug effects of vancomycin. Um, <clears throat> vancomycin is associated with some kind of severe adverse drug effects. Um, it can be nephrotoxic, which is something to uh, keep in mind. We do give it to patients who have um, impaired renal function, which you can see on the bottom, the dosing. I mean, we, we give it to patients on hemodialysis even, um, but it can be nephrotoxic. Also, vancomycin can be ototoxic. Um, it can cause toxicity to the ears. That's important to keep in mind to make sure, um, especially when you're choosing other drugs, to try not to combine multiple agents that are all ototoxic. Okay, there are other agents that are also ototoxic. For example, like gentamicin, for example, is an aminoglycoside antibiotic that's ototoxic. Um, so try not to combine multiple agents together that are all ototoxic. And then also make sure that you're following dosing guidelines so that you're not getting to very high toxic concentrations. Um, if you give a huge amount of the drug, you're going to make it a lot more likely that it's going to damage the kidneys and the ear. Also, infusion reactions are possible. 
Um, infusion reactions include things like Redman syndrome, um, <clears throat> as well as phlebitis. Some of that can be corrected by um, by infusing at the appropriate rate. So not infusing the drug too rapidly, but infusing it at the appropriate recommended rate so that you're not getting too high of a concentration in the vessel at a time. When we look at vancomycin, vancomycin is effective against a lot of resistant bacteria. Um, it's effective against uh, MRSA, MRSE, however, we do see resistance to vancomycin common with Enterococcus thasium, um, especially in hospital acquired infections. So for whatever reason, uh, we call this VRE, vanco resistant enterococcus, or vancomycin resistant enterococcus, VRE. VRE again is, is common in hospitally acquired, so hospital acquired UTIs, um, hospital acquired wound infections, um, endocarditis, meningitis, sepsis, right? Any of these infections that are hospital acquired. Um, now, this is really problematic because typically in these infections, we would use vancomycin. So like these types of infections that can be inherently resistant to cep cephalosporins, we would say, oh, okay, if you're resistant to the cephalosporin, I'm going to give you vancomycin. Um, but now that we're seeing VRE, now that we're seeing these um, infections that are going to also be resistant to vanco, that's really problematic because that's the drug we relied on. So it's like, now what do we do? Um, <clears throat> this is one of the reasons why antibiotic resistance is so challenging because the drugs that we've always relied on are now no longer being effective for us. So we need to make sure that we limit our use of antibiotics because we don't want resistance to develop quicker than we can develop antibiotics to treat the bug. Um, I just wanted to show you down here, guys, this is an example of a chart that we use for dosing, um, for dosing vancomycin. Again, the goal trough is 10 to 20 micrograms per milliliter. So that's the, the goal um, bottom serum concentration, the lowest concentration that we should have in the bloodstream. Notice again, dosing is based off of weight and it's based off of um, creatinine clearance. And this is this chart you use just to kind of come up with the initial dose from the wheat and the initial frequency from the creatinine clearance. And then after that, you can monitor your trough and you can adjust the dose um, based off of that trough. So this is just like an initial guess on, hey, you know, based on how much the patient weighs and what their, um, their renal function is, this is what we think will work. But then the serum the serum concentration monitoring is necessary to double check that because everyone's a little bit different. So here you see the patient's weight and that's actual body weight um, in kilograms. So you see um, as the weight goes up, the doses are going to go up as well. Notice at the top here, we have doses like 500, 750, 1000. And then as we progress down, the doses get bigger, right? So 500 to 750, 1,000, 1250, right? So the doses tend to kind of approximately get bigger as the body gets bigger. Then up top here, we have creatinine clearance. Um, and then you'll notice the frequency of administration can kind of change um, based off of that creatinine clearance. So when liver function, I mean, sorry, when kidney function is good, we dose it, you know, every 12 hours. As kidney function starts to decline, we'll dose it every 24 hours. Um, and then, you know, even less than that, depending on um, dialysis. So here you see if creatinine clearance is less than 30. And then here you see um, when they have scheduled hemodialysis in which case the dosing is just given um, is just given every time after dialysis because the dialysis is going to clean the drug out and then they'll have their, their dose. So for example, let's just say we had a patient who had good kidney function, right? Creatinine clearance was over 100, say 110. 
and the patient weighed 75 kilograms. So I don't know if I can draw a straight line here. I think this is 75 kilograms. Okay, so a 75 kilogram patient with um, creatinine clearance of say 110 milliliters a minute would get 750 milligrams of vancomycin every eight hours. Um, say that patient was, you know, much larger, say they were 110 kilograms, they would get 1,250 every eight hours. If we had a small patient, say we had a patient who was 65 kilograms and they had decreased kidney function um, of, say, 55 milliliters a minute, they would get 1,000 milligrams every 24 hours. Um, <clears throat> so frequency changes right, based on their kidney function and the total daily dose changes based on their weight and those two things kind of come together to help us figure out what their, their overall dosing regimen is going to be. We start with that and then we'll monitor a trough. Once they get to steady state, we'll get a trough to see if um, what we came up with is good, right? If they're in this goal trough range, then you continue with dosing. If they're not, then you adjust the dose to try and get there. Um, <clears throat> Televancin, oridavancin, and dalbavancin are drugs, there are cell wall inhibitors that we classify as lipoglycopeptides. Um, the lipoglycopeptides, these three agents, are really strong um, antibiotics. Again, they're not things that we typically use, you know, on an outpatient basis, and we only give them for severe infections or infections that are uh, rather with very resistant organisms. Their spectrum of activity is very similar to vancomycin in that they're active against gram-positive agents, so they work against most um, strep, staph, and enterococcus. They have increased potency though, compared to Vanco, which Vanco has pretty good potency and it's active against some resistant organisms. So these are even a step above. And they have activity against some um, strains that are resistant to vancomycin. So we use them as an alternative to vancomycin in acute bacterial skin and skin structure infections, um, which we just write ABSSI. Um, also, in hospital-acquired pneumonia caused by resistant organisms like MRSA. Televancin use is limited by its adverse drug effect profile. Televancin happens to have a pretty bad um, adverse drug effect profile. For example, it causes nephrotoxicity, so it damages the kidneys. Um, something that's really important as far as antibiotics go is it causes QT prolongation. So it prolongs the QT interval. Um, this means that it interacts with a couple other antibiotics that also do this. So other antibiotics that also prolong the QT interval include fluoroquinolones and macrolides. We'll talk about both of those um, coming up in a lecture soon, but fluoroquinolones and macrolides also cause QT prolongation. So it's important not to combine televancin with either of those agents. Um, also, it can cause fetal harm. It can cause fetal harm. So if you're going to use televancin, it's important to kind of assess the patient first. Check their renal function um, to make sure their renal function is okay and you're not going to cause more damage. Um, check their current meds or the meds that you're going to start. Make sure you're not giving them with something that causes QT prolongation or make sure that they don't have cardiac issues where they already have QT prolongation. Um, also check potassium because remember that can be associated with QT prolongation um, and then also assess pregnancy status to make sure you're not giving it to a patient who's pregnant. Oridavancin and Delavancin um, are kind of useful in that they can be dosed one time only for acute bacterial skin and skin structure infections. 
So if you have a patient who has a, um, an acute skin, skin structure infection, and it's with a really resistant organism, but otherwise they're doing well and you don't want to keep them hospitalized, it can be very useful to give um, oritavancin or dalbavancin because you can just give them one dose as an outpatient, right? Outpatient. Otherwise, the agents, these agents have to be given parenterally. They're given via injection. So you're not just giving somebody a tablet. Um, and a lot of the other agents like vancomycin, for example, is IV. So it's hard to give that to an outpatient. But these, you can just dose the patient once right then. They can go home and that's it. So it limits the hospital stay, which limits spending. Um, you don't have to place a central catheter. Um, it limits adverse drug effects. So it's, that's really useful in that specific situation. Um, at the bottom here, we see daptomycin. Daptomycin is another drug um, that's an alternative to vancomycin. So daptomycin is an alternative to vancomycin for resistant gram-positive bacteria. So kind of similar to like oritavancin and dalbavancin, um, it's active against MRSA, methicillin-resistant staph aureus, but it's also active against VRE. So remember a lot of enterococcus bacteria are developing resistance to vanco. So if your patient has infection with some sort of vanco-resistant enterococcus, then daptomycin is a drug that could be effective against it. Um, this is indicated for, again, complicated um, skin and soft tissue infections, um, bacteremia, and right-sided endocarditis with staph aureus. Um, notice, though, it's not for pneumonia. Okay, so that's one of the, the differences between the, um, like, these agents up top, Televancin, Oritavancin, and Dalbavancin. Those can be used for hospital-acquired pneumonia, okay, which, is, again, is typically a resistant pneumonia compared to community-acquired pneumonia. Community-acquired pneumonia, we can treat with kind of lesser antibiotics because it's not typically resistant. But hospital-acquired pneumonia can be resistant. It is much more frequently resistant. So we use these agents that um, are effective against resistant um, bacteria. So we can use these top agents, Televancin, Oritavancin, Dalbavancin, for hospital-acquired pneumonia caused by resistant organisms like MRSA but we do not use daptomycin for pneumonia. The reason for that is daptomycin is inactivated by surfactant. Remember, surfactant cover is a, um, a substance, a liquid that, or compound rather, that covers our lungs. When we look at the lungs, um, all along the alveoli, you know, you have your, your, your type 1 pneumocytes that make up the alveoli, and then every so often, you have a type 2 pneumocyte or um, a septal cell. And these type 2 pneumocytes produce surfactant. That surfactant is important. Surfactant covers the alveoli, covers the lungs, and it keeps the lungs inflated. It prevents um, hydrogen bonds from forming between all the water molecules. So it prevents collapse of the alveoli. So surfactant is in our lungs, right? It's all in our lung tissue. So when a patient has pneumonia, the infection is down in the lungs, which have a bunch of surfactant. So the daptomycin will penetrate the lungs, but then it's gonna be inactivated locally by the surfactant. Daptomycin will be in other tissues and it'll be working there. But all of the daptomycin that makes its way down into the lungs is going to be deactivated. So it's not going to be able to work in the lungs. And that's a really important consideration to keep in mind. Um, <clears throat> this is just a kind of chart that points out um, a lot of key characteristics that kind of combines those, those last three agents that we talked about. Um, vancomycin, 
daptomycin, and then uh, televancin. And televancin kind of refers to all three of those agents. But they, these agents are all kind of have similar activity in that they're active against gram-positive organisms, including a lot of resistant organisms like MRSA, um, MRSA, uh, VRE, when we talk about DAPTO and televancin. So this compares those three agents. We see their unique antibacterial um, spectrum. So vancomycin covers C. diff, but that's only the oral version. You see the DAPTO and televancin can cover some VRE, some vanco-resistant enterococcus. The same thing here for televancin. You see the route of administration. Notice they're all IV. Vancomycin is also available by mouth, but that's only for C. diff. You see their administration time, right? How long of an infusion you need to give. Um, Daptomycin is kind of nice because you can also do an IV push versus this long infusion. Um, kinetics, they're all a renal elimination. So that's something you're going to have to alter um, in patients who have decreased renal function. We have um, unique adverse effects listed down here. Um, again, notice for televancin, we have here um, like prolonged QTC interval, um, not recommended in pregnancy. There's a black box warning requiring pregnancy test prior to initiating televancin. Okay, so that is really important. Um, notice over here for um, vancomycin, we have dose-related ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity, which is important to keep in mind. Um, we really mentioned a lot of this, though. Key learning points, right, down here at the bottom. So for vancomycin, drug of choice for severe MRSA infections, oral form only for C. diff, um, monitor serum trough concentrations. Okay, those are all points that we drove home multiple times. Um, daptomycin is inactivated by surfactant, so is never used in pneumonia. Okay, again, very important. Um, for televancin, use with caution in patients with baseline renal dysfunction um, because, one, you're going to... Um, there's further issues with the drug because the drug builds up and it can be renal toxic itself. Um, <clears throat> also, something I didn't mention before is um, any necessary coagulation labs need to be drawn just before the televancin dose to avoid interaction. Um, televancin can interfere with coagulation labs. So like INR, prothrombin time, um, APTT, those can be um, messed up, if you will. They're, they're interfered with by televancin. So if you have a patient who's on warfarin, for example, and you're going to get their INR, um, you need to do that right before you give the televancin because the televancin will be at its most minimal point then and it's less likely to interfere. But keep in mind that your coagulation labs might be messed up. They might not be um, as accurate because of the televancin. So it might be worth avoiding televancin if possible and using an alternative. If you have a patient who is, um, you know, on Coumadin or needs to have some sort of coagulation workup. Um, <clears throat> I think this is our last, possibly our last cell wall inhibitor, inhibitor that we're going to talk about, um, phosphomycin. Phosphomycin inhibits cell wall synthes um, synth <clears throat> synthesis. It does this a little bit differently. It does this by inhibition of, um, I'm not even going to say this, but by this transferase enzyme. Phosphomycin is indicated for UTIs caused by E. coli, um, E. facialis, um, or it can be first line for uh, acute cystitis. Phosphomycin has no cross reactivity with the other cell wall inhibitors. We talked about um, other agents that have very low to almost no cross reactivity. Um, phosphomycin, absolutely no cross-reactivity at all. Uh, phosphomycin is available orally. It's got good distribution to the bladder, the kidney, the prostate. 
um, and it's given as a one-time dose. So it's pretty easy as far as dosing regimen goes. Okay, so let's go ahead and just do a couple practice questions here before we end. A 45-year-old male was admitted to the hospital three days ago with severe cellulitis and a large abscess on his left leg. So some sort of skin and soft structure infection. Um, IND was performed. IND is incision and drainage. So incision and drainage was performed and cultures reveal infection with MRSA. The patient's getting discharged from the hospital. Which of the following will you prescribe for once daily IV MRSA therapy? So one, I need something that covers MRSA. Two, the patient's going home. So I want something that's gonna be given once daily. Um, <clears throat> obviously the patient's gonna have to come back for his infusion therapy. So I don't want him to have to come back twice a day or three times a day to get these infusions. That's just too much. So we need to limit it to once a day so that he only has to come in for his infusion one time a day. So I need an agent for a um, acute bacterial skin and soft structure, or skin and skin structure infection. Um, and I need something active against MRSA and I need something with one's daily dosing. So looking at these agents, the only agent here that has good MRSA coverage um, is daptomycin. So I know that daptomycin covers MRSA um, and it happens to be daily administration. Now, what if I had, you know, instead of Piptazo, what if I had vancomycin as an option here? I still would pick dapto. Um, and the reason for that is, well, I mean, I would need more information, but it's possible that the vanco is not going to be dosed once a day. Um, depending on the patient's weight and renal function, vancomycin can be dosed twice daily. It can be dosed three times daily. But also, remember, we have to do serum, um, serum drug concentration monitoring with vanco. So when the patient's not in the hospital, when it's an outpatient, it's just a lot more difficult to use the vancomycin because of the dosing and because of the monitoring that's required. So daptomycin would be a lot easier to use in that case. A 24-year-old female presents with complaints of sores on the vulva and surrounding the anus. Upon examination, there are sores present in the vagina and the patient's inguinal lymph nodes are enlarged. Social history includes multiple sexual partners and sporadic use of protection. So right off the bat, obviously STDs are a huge concern here. Um, the patient tests positive for syphilis. Which of the following will you prescribe? This is from the original, um, this is from the original lecture on the penicillins, um, but here the answer would be B, penicillin G. Um, penicillin G given intramuscularly. Um, penicillin G is the parenteral penicillin. It's the, per the penicillin that's injected either IV or IM. Penicillin V is the one that's oral by mouth for less severe infections. Um, but penicillin G given intramuscularly is the drug of choice for syphilis. And that is for all stages of syphilis infection. Um, <clears throat> typically penicillin G or penicillin G is curative for syphilis infection at all stages. Um, the dosing that you give and how frequently you give it depends on the type of syphilis, but you can find all of that information on up to date. Um, amoxicillin and um, cephalexin have no spirochete coverage at all. Um, and then televancin, remember we just looked at, televancin is just gram positive coverage only. A 72 year old female presents from a nursing home with fever, mental status changes, urinary urgency and pain. Um, patient's file states a penicillin allergy 
of anaphylaxis. Which of the following is the most appropriate beta-lactam to provide gram-negative coverage for this patient's UTI? So just really quick, the mental status changes are very common with UTIs in the elderly. Um, very, very common. Um, so when you have a patient, an elderly patient who comes in with kind of signs of infection like fever and um, you know, chills, and they also have mental status changes, I would definitely look for a UTI. Um, but the urinary urgency and pain kind of give that away. Now, um, urinary tract infections are typically with gram and negative bacteria. Um, most frequently, E. coli is the, the bacterium. It gets there from, you know, fecal material. Um, <clears throat> so we need to give some sort of beta-lactam to provide gram-negative coverage for this patient. Now, the, the big kind of flashing light that should be going off to you is that there's a penicillin allergy of anaphylaxis. Well, looking at these agents, cefepime, um, and so cefepime and ceftaroline, these are cephalosporins. Um, cephalosporins have about 3 to 5% cross-reactivity with the penicillins. So that's a, a decent amount. If the reaction were very, very, very mild, it might be okay. Um, but this reaction is anaphylaxis. So the cephalosporins are contraindicated in a patient who has an anaphylactic reaction to penicillins. Um, imipenem has less reactivity, um, but it is still possible, whereas astreanam does not. So imipenem um, is like 1% cross reactivity, but again, I'm going to avoid it because of anaphylaxis. As Trinam is going to give us the coverage, the gram negative coverage, um, <clears throat> but it also does not have that cross reactivity. A 48 year old male presents with severe diarrhea that has a distinct strong smell. The patient finished, so severe diarrhea, this distinct smell is like alerting me right now. Um, <clears throat> and it's, people are always like, well, I don't think diarrhea ever smells good, which is true. Yes, diarrhea never smells good. Um, but if you've smelled C. diff diarrhea, then you'll know what I mean. You can smell it from down the hall in a hospital. C. diff diarrhea is very, very bad smelling. Um, so this patient has C. diff diarrhea with a really distinct smell. The patient recently finished a course of broad spectrum antibiotics. So today, um, so he's been taking broad spectrum antibiotics, which means he has killed all of his natural flora in his GI tract and that's what's causing the diarrhea. Um, his original infection is cleared, so that's good, but now the diarrhea is unbearable. You culture the stool and as we expected, um, it shows infection with Clostridium difficile or Clostridioides difficile. Which of the following is the best clinical course? Prescribe IV vancomycin. Um, vancomycin is active against C. diff, so that's good, but I don't want to give it IV. Right? I'm trying to get it into the GI tract, so I don't need to give it all over the body because that's going to cause problems, right? That causes more side effects. That might give the patient ototoxicity. That might give the patient renal toxicity, so I don't need to give it systemically. Tell the patient to stay hydrated and check back in three days. That might be okay for normal diarrhea, but this is C. diff. C. diff is severe diarrhea. We treat C. diff, so no, that's not appropriate. Prescribe PO vancomycin. That can be appropriate. Um, vancomycin is effective against C. diff, and again, giving it by mouth allows you to deliver the drug directly to the site of action and avoid systemic exposure. Um, so C is our answer there. All right, that was it. Um, I appreciate you guys listening and I will see you back next time.